Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, dear colleagues, very good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone, and welcome to the third issue of the FAO in Geneva Nutrition Dialogue Series, which we jointly organize with the Food and Nutrition Division at FAO Equator in collaboration with the uh, Brussels Liaison Office, and we have Rashad uh, Al Khafaji with us uh, from the Brussels Liaison Office. Uh, and my name is Dominique Durgeon, and I'm the director of the FAO Liaison Office with the UN in Geneva, and I will be moderating today's uh, session. Uh, before we start, let me give you a few details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this virtual discussion. Uh, this webinar will be, as usual, in English only, with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will be later available on our website, along with the various related resources relevant to this session. It is scheduled to last for about one hour and 30 minutes. Uh, we have, as usual, reserved some time towards the end of the webinar for a Q&A session. So please uh, submit your question in the Q&A module, not in the regular chat box, and we'll try to accommodate as many uh, interventions as possible. If you have uh, any problem or technical issue, please send a message in the chat box and we'll aim to fix it. Uh, that's all for the, the housekeeping. And I would all like to take a few moments to introduce today's uh, discussion and our speakers. Uh, we are very pleased uh, to have with us today a number of uh, distinguished speakers who intervene on the topic of urban food systems for better diets. Uh, today, we will hear from Ms. Cecilia Marocchino, who is the Urban Agenda Coordinator in the Food System Divisions of FAO. We'll hear from Dr. Ashish Bharati, the Health Officer for the State of Maharashtra Agribusiness and Rural Transformation Project in India. Uh, Mr. Stephen Otieno, uh, who is the Senior Manager for Climate Action Planning in C40 Nairobi. Mr. Abel Dabula, the Head of Program of GAIN Mozambique. Uh, we'll also have Ms. Jessica Pular, the Nutrition Expert leading on UN Food System Summit Action from WHO, who will facilitate a panel reflecting on the case studies presented and actions in for urban spaces uh, to further access to better diet and improved nutrition. Uh, we left in that panel discussion Cecilia Marocchino, as well as Straton Abu Mugisha, uh, the country project manager for Site and Life Rwanda, and Ms. Charlotte Fleschet, International Food Smart Cities Program Director at Ricolto. Thank you very much, colleagues, for agreeing to be with us uh, today. Dear participants, as you know, the purpose of these webinars is to enable us to collectively learn from the field experience in, take, in taking action to leverage the power of agri-food systems to improve nutrition while also achieving other development goals. We aim to feed and inform policymaking with field examples. As it is a practice in this nutrition dialogue series, we'll start by sharing with you the lessons we learned from our webinar last month, which brought a wide range of speakers together to discuss food systems for addressing acute malnutrition and advancing better livelihoods in Africa's drying, from research to action. And to do so, I will, it is my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Corinna Oaks, Senior Nutrition Consultant in the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, and also director of the Center for Food Policy at City University of London, who facilitated the discussion in our nutrition dialogue last time. So Corinna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dominique, and, and good day to, to everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants and colleagues. The lessons we learned from the last webinar have really important implications for how we move forward in agri-food systems research and practice for, for nutrition. The intervention we learned about in the last webinar uh, had positive impacts on diets and nutrition through changes in livestock feeding practices in pastoral drylands 
And this was really good news. It was excellent to be uh, listening to a webinar uh, with such positive results, especially since rates of acute malnutrition among children are incredibly high in these areas. And we learned about what underpinned that success. The first learning was that formative research to understand the basic systemic drivers of malnutrition had been really crucial to the success of that intervention because it enabled an in-depth understanding of the context-specific drivers and it enabled the building of community perspectives into the design of the intervention. What we learned was that we need to see more of this kind of formative research before interventions are designed well. A second learning was that the design of agri-food systems interventions to influence nutrition also need to consider interactions with other systems. In this case, agri-food systems were influenced by livelihood systems, which were in turn influenced by environmental systems. And addressing the problem also required an understanding of the socio-cultural systems in that context. And understanding these interactions and the role of these different systems enable the intervention to take into account all of these different elements. Third and related, agri-food systems interventions that take into account women's vulnerabilities are much more likely to be effective given the burden of food and childcare on women is typical in most settings. And if women are going to have these responsibilities, understanding their perspectives and needs is vital. Fourth, strong coordination and capacity strengthening between different departments and sectors such as health, agriculture, education, water and labor, labor enabled more custom working, Fifth, recognizing interlinkages between systems can help produce co-benefits, not just about improving nutrition. In this case, the intervention also improved animal health, gender equity, and livelihoods. And finally, gathering evidence of impact can fuel scale up of effective agri-food interventions for nutrition. Piloting and proving interventions can work and the conditions in which they work can garner support from donors and others to scale up albeit recognizing that agri-food systems interventions always need to be tailored to the context. So although generated from a particular context, these are evidently important cross-cutting lessons for agri-food systems interventions for nutrition and beyond. And we look forward to learning more from the dialogue today. And with that, back to you, Dominic. Thank you very much, Corinna. I mean, indeed, we, we are committed to start every meeting with uh, with a wrap up of the, the main uh, conclusions of the, the previous one. So thank you again, Corinna, and excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, dear colleagues. Uh, before moving on to our distinguished speakers today, I would like to briefly introduce the topic of today's dialogue. Uh, you just heard that our last dialogue indeed uh, focused on the dryness, and today we deal, we'll discuss a very different topics, uh, cities and towns. Uh, the phenomenon of urbanization, as you know, has been unfold, uh, unfolding uh, rapidly for many years. And over actually over half of the world population lives in cities. And by 2050, an estimated two thirds will live in urban areas. Uh, this is why we at FAO, together with our partners, have increasingly focused on how to ensure agri-food systems in cities are fit for purpose in feeding their population in ways that address this nutrition while simultaneously minimizing waste, making sustainable uh, use of resources and supporting economic development, improving nutrition and harnessing the potential of urbanization to support social outcomes are important part of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. This is particularly the case, as you know, through SDG 2 on ending hunger and malnutrition and SDG 11, which aim to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. One of the principles underpinning these dialogues is that food security and nutrition objectives should not, should not be addressed in isolation as they are inextricably connected with sustainability objectives of other sectors. This is particularly true in urban contexts where the interconnection between food, public health, social protection, agriculture, environment, tourism, housing, and employment, and transport, energy, and land use is evident. 
In that context, today's dialogue will provide examples of how municipalities are working to address nutrition while also considering other development objectives. So now going straight into our uh, presentation, we'll start with uh, by hearing from Ms. Cecilia Marocchino, the Urban Agenda Coordinator in the Food Systems Division of FAO, who will present the Urban Agenda as a framework and resource in which FAO and partners' action in urban space are aligned. Cecilia, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Dominique, and thank you, colleagues, for this invitation. Uh, so I think, I mean, the screen is shared. So let me start introducing some key facts uh, to explain why cities are emerging as a key entry point for promoting sustainable food system transformation. First of all, as Dominique was already mentioning, over half of the global population is currently resides in urban area, and this is expected to rise. In 2050, more than two thirds of all people may be living in urban area and global urbanization to 2050 could lead to a net addition of 2.4 billion people to towns and cities. Then there is another point that cities consume almost 80% of the total energy produced in the world while producing 70% of the global waste. They also account for about 70% of the global energy related green gas emission. Moreover, according to FAO, about 70% of food produced globally is consumed by inhabitants in area classified as urban, and this is expected to increase with the further urbanization. We also need to highlight that more, many urban and peri-urban communities are exposed to food and nutrition insecurity, particularly in developing countries, combined with the rate of overweight and obesity, which are on the rise, particularly in urban setting. We need to highlight that urbanization impact food consumption patterns. Higher urban income tends to increase demand for processed food as well as animal source food. In developing countries, in urban areas, a significant proportion of individual food consumption occurs outside home, mainly with the food provided by street food vendors, fast food, and with this change, the nutrient content of diet is changing. Typically diet are becoming higher in salt, fat, and sugar. So my first key point is that with this level urbanization, with all these challenges that sitting are facing in terms of food waste management, increased pressure of natural resources, it is fundamental to recognize the role that cities and local government can play in accelerating sustainable food system transformation and in promoting the access to nutritious food and healthy diet. Next, please. So cities have enormous, have enormous potential when it comes to food system transformation. We have done an FAO survey undertaken in 2020 to assess the impact of COVID-19 on urban food system. And with this survey, we clearly demonstrated the central role that cities and local government played in limiting the effect of the pandemic on the health and food security of their citizens and in the efforts to ensure access to food for the most vulnerable. We collected 80, 861 responses from 77 countries with 57% of respondents being members of local government. And the responses cover different typology of cities from metropolitan to intermediary and rural towns and the broad geographical and city sites distribution of the responses generated insight into the range of challenges and approach that were ad adopted. The key point in this survey, uh, this survey has found that action at the local level in most of the case are not sufficiently supported. Cities are really doing a lot, but they are not sufficiently supported by appropriate resources and co-particularly coordination with action at national level. 
Therefore, my second point is that it is fundamental to prioritize an urban, urban food system and bridge the national, local governance and policy gap. Next, please. FAO has decided from long time to prioritize the urban food system agenda and to support local and subnational government in integrated food system in their policy planning and actions. Over the past decade, we have made the case for of the fundamental importance of engaging with cities in our work. And we, uh, the FAO framework was launched for the urban food agenda has been launched in 2018. It refers to four guiding principles, urban rural linkage, social inclusion and equity, resilience and sustainability, and the system thinking, the food system connection, the, co the connection between the different components and the food system, and the, the connection between food system and other systems. The approach includes uh, supporting cities in establishing the multi-stakeholder food governance mechanism, undertaking the urban food system holistic analysis and implementing a number of concrete actions, which are entry point so with sp using specific entry point, such as urban and peri-urban agriculture, public food procurement, market and food retailing environment, food waste management. Next, please. Moreover, uh, in 2020, the Green Cities uh, Action Program has been launched by the Director General, which include urban food system at the center uh, of the, the implementation plan. The Green Cities aim at mainstreaming food system and green spaces in local policy planning and action, focus on urban and peri-urban agriculture, forestry and food system, and aim at reach 1,000 cities in 10 years. Next, please. Moreover, FAO has launched uh, a new priority program, which is called Achieving Sustainable Urban Food System, and is currently one of the 20 priority program of our strategic pro program 2022-2031. Uh, and this is a clear sign of the strategic importance that FAO is increasingly giving to this topic. This PPA brings together FAO urban food system work and the framework of the Green Cities Initiative uh, and provide the overall framework for FAO urban work, including the urban food agenda and the Green Cities Initiative, which I've been mentioned before. And with this priority program, we aim to support national and local decision makers of small, intermediary and metropolitan cities to initiate, coordinate and scale up actions and investments towards urban and territorial food system transformation. So we are gonna, uh, we aim at having impact at different level on gender equality and on healthy diet, on the resilience and sustainability and on the management of national resources. So next please. Another piece of work is what FAO has been doing during the United Nations Food System Summit convened by UN Secretary General last year. In this context, uh, it, it has been established a specific urban food system coalition to promote coherent action on urban food system to elevate the voice of local government in global fora and particularly start working across different level of government. So the, the main uh, goal of, the, of the, the key objective of the, uh, the coalition is uh, really to, uh, to support local and subnational government in getting engaged in global policy space, following on the extensive exchange conducting during the Food System Summit, sharing knowledge and information on urban food system at the global level, and also promote peer-to-peer -peer exchange on urban food system between national and local government. And as a follow-up of the UN Food System Summit, so the coalition aim to support national government to include cities and local government in the process of implementation of their pathways and other relevant agreement. Next, please. 
So uh, with the reference under the framework uh, of, the, of the, the, the priority program, uh, achieving sustainable urban food system and in, the, in the, uh, considering the FAO framework for the urban food agenda, so uh, there are a number of initiatives uh, on urban food system. We have a project, a global project, like the feeding urbanization. We have the project at national level in DACA, in Kenya, uh, covering um, intermediary, small and the metropolitan cities. And we have a number of what we call a quick win action under the framework of the Green Cities Initiative, all related to urban food system. Them. I want to mention uh, quickly uh, some of this work that we are doing in, uh, in FAO. So for instance, the project uh, feeding urbanization. So it's, uh, it's a project where we are, um, we are using the FAO framework for the urban food agenda is supporting cities in establishing food governance mechanism involving uh, more than 30 institution and civil society organization. So we have mapped uh, the retail environment, the retail market uh, to for inform the policy making process. We have worked on agroecological garden. Um, so we have also implemented public procurement scheme uh, and more than 50 cooperatives have been supported to apply this public procurement process and also try to connect uh, the, 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 the production to uh, the school meals program involving more uh, targeting more of around 40,000 children and at those, um, uh, in, in, uh, in Ecuador, uh, in Porto Viejo, in an intermediary cities uh, and in the province of Manabi in Ecuador. Um, so next, please. I want to also to mention the importance of uh, entry point. So I was mentioning that the actions that we can implement at the local level, we can have different entry point, big procurement, market, urban and peri-urban agriculture. So and then according to the different need, uh, and the different uh, priority at the local level, the, 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 the entry point is, choose, is, is usually always uh, selected at the local level through uh, a multi-stakeholders process. But what is important, of course, these are just entry points. It could be food waste management, market, food distribution. But what is fundamental is, and what we are trying to work with the cities, is to promote the system thinking and connect, and, and connect this food system with other system. To conclude, there is no doubt that a greater focus on urban food system is critical to delivering the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We will continue raising the voice of local government and promote sustainable urban food system transformation in various global fora, for instance, in, at the World Urban Forum in Katowice, which will happen next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cecilia for this uh, excellent presentation and for highlighting indeed that with the level of urbanization and the challenge that we are dealing with, it is fundamental to recognize the role of cities in accelerating sustainable food system transformation. Uh, thank you also for presenting the, the result of your survey when, where you demonstrated the role of cities and municipalities in limiting the COVID impact. Uh, I think it was important also to, to know about the the FAO framework for urban food agenda and its principles and the ambitious FAO Green Cities uh, Action Program, but also to, to remind us that in view of its importance, uh, this uh, agenda is really one of the, the pillar of the FAO uh, strategic uh, framework and uh, also for presenting a couple of examples. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Cecilia, and uh, we know here from uh, Dr. Ashish Bharati, the health officer from the state of Maharashtra, uh, agribusiness and uh, rural transformation project in India, uh, will share with us the experience of the process of setting up the multi-stakeholder group on nutrition input systems in the municipality of Pune. 
Dr. Barati, uh, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for joining us from, from uh, the field. The floor is yours. So good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Ashish Bharti. I am the Chief Health Officer from Pune Municipal Corporation. Uh, I have done uh, my MD in public health and I have uh, worked at state level in the uh, health and nutrition department. And I have been deputed uh, to the Pune Corporation. And I am working here since two years. Uh, I will be focusing on how uh, the Pune city has uh, been involved in setting up the multi-stakeholder groups for uh, making a robust food health system and a resilient uh, food system for the city. So uh, these, would, uh, these would be the topics uh, in brief, which I would be covering in my presentation. Uh, I will be giving an uh, overview, overview of the nutritional status in the city and the various partnerships and initiatives which PMC has been implementing to achieve uh, uh, good health for, for the citizens of Pune. And uh, finally, the formation of the multi-stakeholder group so uh, this is about uh, Pune city. As we know, Pune is a metro city in, in our country and it is the second most populous city, eighth, eighth most populous city uh, in the country and second most populous city in the state of Maharashtra. Uh, it is uh, neighboring, neighboring, to, neighboring to the economic capital of India, that is Mumbai. And uh, uh, more than 5 million population uh, people are residing in, in the Pune, Pune city. And we all know uh, Pune, uh, it, is, it was being uh, called the Oxford of the East and uh, having the maximum number of colleges of all faculty, all fields and uh, ample of employment opportunities are there in uh, Pune city. So in, in the city, we have a huge uh, amount of migration. Uh, we have a large number of students incoming from all the neighboring uh, districts and neighboring states and also migrant laborers who come for work in the city. Now about, uh, in short, about the Pune Municipal Corporation. Pune, in, the, in the Pune city, we have two municipal corporations. One is the Pune Municipal Corporation and the other is the Pimpri Chinswar Municipal Corporation. Uh, we have a executive branch and a deliberative branch, both govern the city. And the executive branch is headed by Honorable Commissioner, Municipal Commissioner of uh, Pune Municipal uh, Corporation. And the uh, deliberative branch is headed by the mayor. And the budget outlay, as we can uh, see here, is uh, 8,592 crores uh, for a year. Now, regarding the nutritional status, uh, these are the figures which are, which are taken from the Niti Aayog dashboard. Uh, which was formed based on the findings of NFHS, uh, National Family Health Survey, and DLHS district level household surveys. So as we see from this slide, uh, we can see that uh, out of the chil uh, surveyed, uh, surveyed children, nearly about 25% children had st uh, uh, stunting, wasting, and they were underweight. So if you look, look at the figures of stunted, wasted, and underweight children, out of the surveyed uh, population of children, 25% were having uh, stunting, wasting, and uh, underweight. Uh, as we can also see, nutritional anemia is uh, quite prevalent in the city. Uh, it, is, it is more in the adolescent girls and uh, women, and more than 50% more than of children are affected by nutritional anemia. Uh, during the household surveys, uh, we can... Uh, uh, during, during the household survey, when the survey team had visited the houses, uh, they came to know that uh, food insecurity accounted for almost 25%, out of which severe uh, food insecurity was reported by around 10% of households, and 42% uh, uh, reported of, uh, like uh, they had uh, insufficient food intake or less uh, food was available uh, uh, with them, less food options were available with them. So this is in short uh, about the nutritional status uh, of the city. Um, like uh, I, I previously told uh, Pune, Pune is totally urban, like more, more than 60% of population is urban. 
we have around uh, more than more than 550 slums are there uh, out of which uh, two, around 230 are registered slums and the others are formed due to the migrated population who come to the city and they uh, reside somewhere and those are temporary slums so around 550 uh, slums are on record out of which two, 230 are uh, registered slums and uh, as we know the over increasing population uh, also demands uh, to make make of, uh, available the food food uh, for these uh, people like like uh, the supply uh, supply has to be, has to match the demand of the increasing population uh, there are various dietary pattern, patterns various food habits which affect this uh, demand like most of the population uh, are, uh, are around 20% of the population uh, which stay in Pune city right now, they, they are the students who have come uh, from outside. They prefer outside food. They uh, keep on going to um, neighboring, neighboring uh, places. And uh, uh, so there is a great demand for uh, street food and uh, which uh, uh, and uh, for, for this reason, we need to increase the uh, supply outlet. Now, uh, uh, to uh, meet meet this this challenge of catering to uh, food demand of a growing population, uh, Pune Municipal Corporation has taken a few steps in order to make make a uh, in order to make a resilient uh, food system, food delivery system, food handling system. So. Uh, uh, we have been in partnership uh, with uh, uh, a project called Bindi. Bindi is the Birmingham Indian Nutrition Initiative, which was started long back in 2016, which has enabled us, enabled us to uh, more share share more experiences and uh, running some pilot projects, uh, projects uh, we, 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 which are definitely helping us to frame our policies at state and national level. Uh, Pune has also been a signatory to Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, uh, which, uh, which, has, which has been uh, focusing on uh, developing sustainable food systems and uh, helping the food uh, systems to, to make more food secure and uh, resilient. Uh, this is about the Bindi study, Birmingham uh, Indian Nutrition Study. Uh, in which uh, more than 3,000 adults were surveyed, and uh, out of the findings, some uh, some uh, important findings have been shown uh, here. Uh, majority people were concerned about the unhealthy street food, like uh, street food uh, consumption is more, and unhealthy street food was a uh, issue of concern uh, by majority of uh, uh, people, and uh, most of the people who prefer outside the outside. Uh, they eat at home and uh, even uh, out, they prefer to eat outside as well. The commonest uh, food item which is consumed uh, outside home is food, uh, tea and coffee. And uh, uh, some of the citizen su uh, suggestions uh, which came out of the study in the project uh, were that younger population wanted that the fruits and vegetables to be more affordable and the midday meal school which is run by our education department some uh, people suggested that raw ingredients should be directly taken uh, from the farmers and uh, uh, some stressed upon the uh, adding the nutrition education in the school curriculum and uh, most of the employees which were surveyed they had demanded for healthy canteens so these were uh, some of the findings and concerns of the bindi project um, uh, from this slide uh, i want to show uh, the importance of uh, developing a robust uh, urban food system like we are all aware that the Pune city is one of the biggest metros in India and uh, we do have a uh, farmer weekly farmer markets uh, which are located in ward levels in Pune city we have 15 wards uh, uh, which, which are uh, geographically located in various um, uh, areas and uh, in each ward, we have a weekday designated as the weekly farmers market in which the farmers from the rural areas, they come and they sell their uh, products there. Uh, so uh, we need to have a um, robust uh, food, urban food system. Now, uh, 
the aim of the urban urban smart project is to improve the nutrition intake of uh, citizens residing in pune corporation area and the objectives of this project are to build safe food systems and improve the nutritional status through awareness generation making the food accessible and available available to uh, citizens and also through uh, building a strong uh, rural linkages like i previously said so uh, these are the various components of the urban food food smart project uh, these are our uh, in, uh, broad uh, outcomes which we uh, which we propose to achieve we, we want to achieve behavior behavior, ch behavior change among the citizens um, behavior change among the food handlers uh, by training and awareness generation by contacting the uh, food suppliers hotels restaurant employees uh, of our corporation uh, who go for visiting uh, and um, uh, finding the this thing now also uh, there is a, there is a need to uh, uh, build a proper robust infrastructure for, for the weekly farmers market which i previously said which are in the 15 wards uh, we need to provide the infrastructure uh, sanit sanitation facilities and disposal of solid waste at uh, which are generated as these uh, facilities also development of warehouses to store the uh, harvested uh, food items which come to the city for uh, being available to the local local citizens also uh, we, we we want to achieve uh, we want to improve the goat meat value chain like we have a uh, government run slaughterhouses we we want to uh, develop clean uh, environment at at these places clean handling clean cutting clean uh, selling and uh, uh, proper storage and waste disposal uh, through our uh, outcome the improvement of the goat value and lastly uh through the uh, we want to uh, assess our system uh, through the uh, guidelines given by fao and uh, definitely increase uh, knowledge and cap uh, build the capacity of our uh, stakeholders now uh, uh, these were the major challenges uh, which were, uh, which were previously identified lack of food management and planning and high level of food loss inefficient tra transportation and storage which which need to be uh, improved now this is the multi stakeholder group which we have already um, uh, formed it was based on the situation uh, analysis which was previously done by the bindi project and uh, uh, this group comprises of government uh, stakeholders from various departments un agencies civil so societies private sector uh all the stakeholders which are uh, playing uh, their role in the pune city and uh, we would definitely uh, uh, benefit by this project by uh, building a resilient uh, food system and uh, this is the process which we followed and uh, very recently we, we would be having uh, uh, different training and uh, review sessions with these multiple uh, stakeholders uh, which which play their role in the uh, in building the resilience of food systems in pune city so uh, i on behalf of the pune corporation believe uh, that these initiatives will definitely help uh, improve our food systems assess uh, the food systems improve them bri bridge the gaps and uh, definitely uh, provide good nutrition to our citizens residing in pune city and lastly i thank uh, the team at uh, geneva for giving me this opportunity to uh, give a brief overview of uh, nutrition in pune city thank you thank you uh, dr bharati and uh, really very impressive presentation and i apologize if we didn't have enough time to to go into the detail of it because I think it's a, indeed a very rich experience uh, built in a, in, a, in, in a context that is indeed very emblematic of what we try to, to achieve. Uh, one of the most populous city in India and I think you have very well illustrated the challenges that, that, that you are facing, including on the nutrition side with uh, indeed quite high level on, uh, on most of the indicators, but in the meantime, the, the initiative and partnership taking, taken by the, 
uh, Pune uh, Municipal uh, Corporation, including in the context of the BIMD uh, project and the SMART uh, project. So thank you very much uh, for that. And we will make sure that all the material that you have been using, as well as your details, uh, are being uh, put on the FAO website so that so that people who want to reach out to you and have more details have the opportunity to do so because I think it's indeed a very very uh, interesting project that you have made. So thank you, uh, Dr. Barati, uh, for that. And we know here from uh, Mr. Abel Dabula, the head of program of Game Mozambique, will speak about the about resilient informal food markets. Nutrition and Governance, uh, which is a case study of PEMBA in, uh, in Mozambique. So, uh, Dr. Dabula, Mr. Dabula, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning everyone. We see you and we can see your presentation. So, please go oh, ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> So this is about the resilient reform of food markets, nutrition and governance, a case study of Pemba, Mozambique. My name is Abel Dabula, I'm head of programs in Mozambique. And this is also by uh, Anne Trevor Jones, uh, our colleague which leads the, the food system governance program. Oops, sorry, I'm stuck here, okay. So uh, this is the outline of our presentation. Uh, we will have a uh, we'll touch uh, some on hunger, malnutrition, and local food markets. Uh, Pemba City uh, context, uh, our resilient work, and then uh, gain food system approach. And lately, some information about that and policy options. You can see clearly from the map, Pemba City is pointed out is in the north. And uh, as we proceed, you will see more. You will hear more about it. So uh, hunger, malnutrition, uh, and local food markets. So our focus is on just food systems transformation. So we are looking at those living on low incomes, most vulnerable to malnutrition. Of course, we're also looking at gender transformation and youth lands. But here, gender, we're not looking just as a, a, as from a perspective of data segregation. We're also looking at uh, options or alternatives uh, interventions to make sure that women get engaged in a uh, different stage uh, uh, of governance. Let's say, for instance, market uh, committees, for instance. And so we uh, operate, uh, intervene at, in unique urban contests. So we look at the contest, specific contests of each city or, or urban uh, areas. And on another angle, we look at double burden of malnutrition, for example, especially in stress uh, uh, environment. For example, underweight, overweight, obesity, a hidden hunger, and adequate consumption of micronutrients. Here includes also, you know, some uh, green leaves, especially in areas of stress, such as in the case of Pemba City, where access to food is really, really a challenge. So, uh, hunger, malnutrition, and local food markets. Uh, we, for, for us, traditional food markets or markets is all about access including special distribution of staple and nutritious food. Because essentially, uh, the major challenge for most of the vulnerable people is the access to food and nutritious products. We're also looking at safe, desir desirable, diverse, and affordable food products. Those are four key indicators that really push the agenda of people that are looking to access to, to food products. Uh, when it comes to links, uh, Pemba City, for instance, has short and long and fragile food, food system value chain. Uh, Pemba does not have large uh, uh, land for agriculture, especially for urban agriculture, and is really, um, uh, let's say, the trade of food products is mainly made by street vendors. Uh, currently, we are working with the city council to ensure that they build a new wholesale market. And this is in combination and collaboration with uh, the whole uh, union of wholesale markets. Markets is not just about food products. It's also about incomes and jobs. So for example, in this context that we are uh, discussing today, uh, we are talking about also SMEs like transporters, peri-urban farmers, vendors, and of course, obviously consumers who are most vulnerable. Uh, 
to talk about Pemba City, uh, I would like to share with you a short video uh, that will contextualize more about the city. Cities are unique. They have unique food systems and unique challenges. Pemba, a port city in Mozambique, is situated in the oil and gas rich province of Cabo Delgado, where conflict has been intensifying. This is displacing people, including many lone children who are continuously arriving in Pemba and surroundings. Pemba residents also have multiple health challenges like malaria, HIV and or AIDS, and cholera. Dry conditions reducing vegetable production yields and cyclones and tropical storms which have extensively damaged infrastructure. COVID-19 worsened the impact of these challenges. It disrupted food systems, especially around traditional markets, and reduced access to healthy diets. People's livelihoods, food security, nutrition, income, jobs and health were impacted. So, uh, this is a brief context of Pemba. Uh, to give you a uh, kind of in deep analysis uh, of context, let's say, uh, looking at Pemba food insecurity between uh, April and September 2021, when we started our intervention uh, in this particular city, uh, you're looking at your left, you'll see the food insecurity, uh, and Pemba was a rest stress, looking at uh, acute malnutrition situation also. Uh, we were uh, in a serious, I mean, already serious uh, concerns. But uh, May 22, uh, and projection on your right, June, uh, September 22, shows us that this still is a very stressed area. I mean, the reason of the stress uh, is combination of uh, climate change, cyclones, uh, heavy rains, and some in some of the areas of, of the province, some droughts, but also the armed conflict uh, which is essentially a terrorism conflict. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, displaced people moving from different areas to Pemba, which is the capital city. And of course, they're looking for a more safe and secure place. But this particular slide shows us uh, the vulnerability and demographic of prof uh, and profile of people that have moving in. But for instance, just to give us an idea, uh, Pemba City back uh, in 2017 was uh, around 175,000 people. And today, according to municipal data, is about 382. So we have the double of the population in the city, which press the over, uh, overall uh, food system and, of course, the demand for food products. So based on that contest uh, of the COVID-19, uh, uh, GAIN, uh, through its program, Keep Food, Keep food Markets Working, we, in collaboration with the city of Pemba, we implemented several activities, mainly at the markets. At that time, markets were not closed uh, necessarily, but uh, they, the markets fa market vendors face huge challenge to access to products as the many, uh, many, most of the products are imported from South Africa uh, or Zimbabwe. And of course, a great portion from uh, uh, local production. But, this shows how Pemba needs a lot of uh, food products. So this project was uh, implemented in Pemba and Beira, Mozambique and other cities in Africa and Asia. So uh, essentially, we also built through this program uh, the, uh, a local food system uh, dashboard with the cities. Uh, and of course, this was possible due to uh, connection to other six work streams within GAIN, including uh, two focus on SMEs and food safety. So resilience markets 20, 2022 onwards. Uh, our focus will be just on food safety and nutrition, uh, food system nutrition uh, transition. Uh, we uh, focus on inclusive and equitable, uh, let's say, uh, transition. PEMBA is gonna be our focus. Uh, of course, it's a continuation of the work that we have done uh, as demonstrated before. Uh, wholesale market is uh, on the way to be built. Uh, we understand that wholesale market will be the key driver of the whole food system in that particular city because as we discussed before, most of the products are important and we need to make sure that products are available throughout the year. And of course, the subnational dashboard will continue in this particular phase. So GAIN's approach for the uh, resilient uh, food markets. 
uh, is we essentially uh, we are driven by local led and contextual uh, uh, analysis of each particular region where we operate where multi stakeholder uh, uh, defensors was participatory and people centered we are looking at resilient food markets in the sense of not just having food products available but making sure that all uh, stakeholders uh, have access to different means to ensure that this works properly. City focus, supporting the cities as main uh, stakeholder. Connected across government, for instance, we, are, uh, we have been working with the National Secretariat for Food Safety uh, and Food Security and Nutrition. And ultimately, it's all about a food system framework. So give you uh, more details on our approach. Uh, government uh, multi-stakeholders, uh, for governance multi-stakeholders, for instance, market committees, SMEs, wholesale markets, know your food systems, evidence-based, and here we really privilege the evidence as our key uh, key uh, element of decision when we decide uh, interventions. Mobilizing nutrition and community, here we are looking at training uh, market vendors to become champions uh, especially when it comes to food safety, waste, uh, and health foods. External work, uh, network, it's all about connecting different stakeholders, but PEMBA itself is already a, a member of Milan Urban Food Policy Pact City uh, as such. So talking about evidence, uh, as I said, under this program, Keep Food Markings Working uh, in PEMBA City, working with the stakeholders of the city, including the, 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 the city managers, we came up to this uh, rapid needs assessment that gave us this uh, information. Overall, the major food being sold uh, were vegetables, 50%, and legumes, 40%. Uh, here, the most interesting is to see that uh, people that were not selling uh, in, in Pemba before uh, the COVID, I mean, within, uh, 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 let's say, a time frame of one to three years, it's about 33 people, 33%, which means that the pressure of IDPs, the displaced people from other regions to Pemba, is real high in this city. So from this work, uh, the city council and its stakeholders managed to uh, come up with 11 key areas of interventions and 45, 54 action, uh, actions. Those actions include the policy and coordination. And policy, it's not always about a, a new policy or a new law. It's, all, it's mostly about uh, having the, 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 the right and the key stakeholders to interpret, to implement, and to own the, 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 the leadership on existing uh, policies, which most of the, in most cases, are not implemented correctly. So from the work, uh, the city of Pemba came up with a key intervention uh, and priority interventions in this, uh, for, the, for their, their own uh, governance. One of them is the market infrastructure, which we now we are giving response with this wholesale market, but capacity of markets governance, cold storage, for instance, which is critical since Pemba is a very, very uh, tropical city, uh, temperatures are averaging about uh, 30 to 35 uh, Celsius degrees. Uh, emergence of new informal street markets, which is over uh, uh, in overall place of the Pemba. Uh, Disrupted food system, uh, lack of urban agriculture and ineffective use of urban and peri-urban green space. Uh, loss of income, jobs, purchase power. All, all those are the priorities identified and selected by the city council as their key priorities. So in the end, all, uh, after all our, our support, the city council came up with, a, let's say, a very strong plan of uh, actions. And they are now equipped to proceed with uh, more, let's say, coordinated interventions. So a key glance uh, on actions, public part public and private partnership at short and long term, for instance, are really the, the key to ensure that this will uh, work, especially when you talk about the food systems, inclusive multi-stakeholders, uh, but mostly looking at uh, the technology. Uh, although we are talking about a, a country that is considered one of the poor countries, technology is advancing a lot, and technology can be used to ensure that the markets and all stakeholders around the market can be more informed and timely informed in terms of uh, uh, coordinating the activities. 
So I would like to thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dabula, for this uh, presentation, for indeed presenting the, the, the game approach uh, to the situation and to the, the particular case of, uh, of PEMBA, which at the top of the challenges it was facing before, of course, is also to deal with the, the situation related to the Cabo Delgado insecurity, which all has been exacerbated by COVID. Uh, highlighting the, the importance of uh, evidence for, for decision making, the importance of the rapid needs assessment uh, that have enabled you to work with the municipality of Pemba uh, to identify the right set of short and longer term interventions uh, that need to be implemented, and uh, including, as you said, the, the use of technologies, uh, for example, on information, which is indeed very important. So, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dabula for this presentation, and I will now move to our last speaker for this first part, uh, which is Mr. Stephen Otieno, uh, Senior Manager for Climate Action Planning in C40 uh, Nairobi, will speak about reducing food waste as a means of aligning efforts on climate and nutrition. Uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Seems we have an issue with the connection. Stephen, you may want to turn off your video. We have an issue. Uh, Can we try again, Mr. Otieno? <coughs> okay, we seem to have an, an, an issue with Mr. Otieno, so um, we may need then to move to the next part if we are not able to uh, reconnect, reconnect him and go into the, the, the panel uh, discussion and uh, then see if we can have uh, Mr. Otieno later on. But now, so we'll go into the, the panel discussion segment of our session today and uh, our panelists will uh, reflect on the case studies Ah, I see that Mr. Otieno is back. Mr. Otieno, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Apologies, my internet. Okay, is so issue. please, please go ahead with your presentation. Sorry for that, colleagues. Thank you. And very you may much. want to turn off your video while you speak. Sure. So uh, today, today I'll speak to you about uh, reducing food waste as a means of aligning uh, the effort on climate and nutrition, and I'll base my case study on uh, the work that we've done in the city of Nairobi but also uh, the work that we continue to do at C40 Cities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with this uh, context uh, from uh, the Eat Lancet report uh, that was re released some time back that shows uh, uh, the diet gap that we're experiencing in uh, developing countries and uh, looking at the shifting diet, uh, part, dietary patterns that are actually associated, uh, especially in uh, developing countries in terms of uh, consumption of ultra processed food if you look at the at the image on your left that's the global uh the the, the globe the, the global uh, planetary health boundary uh but if you look at the one on the right that's mostly in sub-saharan africa and uh, you can see that uh there's uh there's low consumption of whole grains vegetables and dairy dairy and nuts but also uh you can see that uh it's skewed towards uh, high consumption especially of starchy food. 
So that is something to consider, especially right now, as you, as we as we look at the, the environmental and climate risks that most of the the staples are facing, the economic inflation risks, and also the geopolit geopolitical risks that are actually pushing more people into hunger. Next slide, please. Uh, a brief context about the city of Nairobi. Uh, uh, currently, I think we're around 5 million people, but uh, uh, official records uh, from 2019 shows 4.4 million people. Uh, that is an increase of about 29% uh, from the 2009 figures. So you can see the population is continuing to increase. Uh, only 20% of uh, the food that is consumed Uh, is actually generates uh, a, more than 2,400 tons of waste per day. And uh, uh, most significant to note is that 65% of this waste is actually organic, but it all ends up in the dump site. So that's quite significant when you talk about uh, the mitigation potential. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, access to food uh, in Nairobi is, I think, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have uh, at the moment. Uh, and by access, I mean our affordability, uh, availability of adequate and nutritious food. Uh, you can see that people access food from different sources, of course, and places. The majority of households in Nairobi, actually, more than 80%, uh, according to our latest survey, they rely on purchased food. Uh, to meet their household needs, and that uh, corresponds to between 30 to 40 percent of their disposable income. Uh, of course, the main past, uh, food that is purchased, as I mentioned, are uh, staples. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, vegetables and fruits, uh, and of course, uh, red meat and uh, poultry and dairy. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, wow, another another significant uh, challenge that we have in the city in terms of uh, uh, reducing food loss has actually been pointed out in the markets is a poor infrastructure. So if you look at the photo on your left, then you can see uh, uh, that was about two, uh, four years ago. Uh, that's the same market that uh, was not well sort of uh, designed. And you, you can see the, the challenges that are there in terms of drainage and so on. And you can see the impacts that uh, they're making uh, potentially inaccessible for most consumers. But on the right, uh, that's the uh, current market that has just been improved by the, the city government. And you can see that uh, uh, it improves actually food handling and reduces food loss. So that's one of the challenges that uh, has been, uh, the city government has been working on in terms of improving infrastructure uh, in markets. Next slide, please. I want to present uh, the framework for Nairobi's food system strategy. Nairobi uh, officially launched its food system strategy on the 5th of, uh, last, uh, of last month after it was passed by the council. There's a lot of work that FAO has been supporting this work. Uh, also to note that uh, I joined C40 on second day, second main from FAO to support the city to develop this strategy. So there's a lot of work that I've been doing in terms of uh, uh, developing the strategy and the, uh, the methodology that they use uh, uh, of course, you can see on your left in terms of uh, in, uh, develop, uh, sort of creating a multi-stakeholder platform that helped from the first step of uh, the analytical studies. Uh, they developed a rapid urban food system assessment re uh, results tool, uh, they call, which they call the ROFSAT tool. And definitely uh, with the gaps that were identified, they were able to support the city and to come up with a food system strategy. And uh, uh, this food system strategy, uh, you can see that uh, has four key objectives. The first one is to increase food production from the city. As I mentioned earlier, on, only 20% of the food that is consumed in the city is actually uh, produced here. Uh, then of course, there's a stable, uh, there's a stable food supply uh, and income. And then uh, the third one, which is the uh, key one, is the reduction of food losses. And then, of course, to improve the welfare of food consumers, uh, that ties closely to uh, food safety. The city's strategy on food loss uh, is actually threefold. So, uh, one of the key strategies is actually to enhance value addition, uh, to promote uh, uh, food recovery, especially working with private sector, you know, hotels, and so on. 
and then of course to increase the cycling of food waste which C40 is actively working to support the city. There were three, four key, four key uh, aspects that we found that were interesting in the development of the strategy. And that is, uh, first of all, because in cities, most cities work in silos and there was very difficult for, 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 for the city to actually uh, position this work in one department. So the first thing that they did was actually to change the name from the agriculture and fisheries, uh, fisheries and forestry to the food agriculture and forestry, which was actually very uh, impactful in terms of giving this uh, that mandate. And then, of course, there was a creation of a directorate to spearhead that work. Then the third point, which is really critical, was the, the creation of multi-sectoral food system coordination committee. And with this, as uh, I've seen now, also Abel and uh, Dr. Shiz mentioned, Nairobi is also a part of the uh, a member of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. And uh, what they have in Nairobi is that they have a rotational chair of that pact. So currently, there's a uh, the head of of the education department sits there, and then the next year, the head of the health. Uh, deck docket in the city sits on that chair. So there's all that cross-sectoral uh, uh, coordination within the city, which is very, we found very uh, uh, important. And then of course, there's the engagement of uh, a multi-stakeholder food advisory liaison group, which was also launched uh, with the food system strategy, which really helps to uh, include all these stakeholders uh, to support this, this strategy. Next slide, please. Uh, closely tied to that uh, is another key milestone, uh, uh, the Nairobi Climate Action Plan, which uh, uh, C40 supported the city to develop, which was launched last week on the 14th of June. I'll be able to share with you all these uh, documents later on. Uh, one of the key notes that we, in terms of reducing food waste that Nairobi City has uh, actually prioritized in, 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 the, in, the, in the Climate Action Plan is to transition to a circular economy. Uh, create uh, material recovery facilities, and just to make sure that uh, as little as uh, I think 20% or 30% of their waste ends up in the dam sites and not uh, the current uh, uh, 70, 65% uh, that is already there. So they, there are plans and uh, uh, ready to action, uh, ready to implement actions that have already been been highlighted in the plan that we can be able to read after the after this. Next slide, please. Secondly, uh, there is also a, a sort of area, area, an alignment between the, the food system strategy and the Nairobi Climate Action Plan. And uh, this is, you can say this is in terms of uh, helping, as I mentioned before, reducing the emissions that are coming from the markets. This is a photo of one of the markets, and this is just uh, food that is uh, wasting there because it, it's lost there because of uh, lack of uh, storage facilities and transportation challenges that are there. So there are about 30 to 50 percent of some produce that actually just do make it to the market, but they don't leave the market just because of inefficient storage facilities. And these are some of the things that are being highlighted and uh, are being spearheaded by the city to make sure that they respond to this. Uh, next slide, please. So what can cities do? Uh, from our experience uh, working with the city, I think there are, four, uh, there are five key issues that uh, perhaps uh, can really support uh, uh, this work. Uh, first of all, we, we believe that uh, building political capital uh, and support from the mayors, the assemblies and city executives, I think is very important. The second component we believe is that it's important to accelerate te technical support. And of course this in involves highly you know, uh, accurate and quality data, uh, access to global best practices, tools, methodologies, and also local and global experts to deliberate on some of these issues. Uh, we also believe that uh, establishing a multi stakeholder platform has be, is very, very useful, and especially within the city context, but also externally and engaging community associations, the academia, private sector, and even civil society organizations. The fourth component that we think is really important is actually to finance high impact actions. So we look at the actions that have uh, potential for core benefits that can be financed to deliver uh, some of the meaningful uh, uh, benefits to, to the city. And finally, I think one of the most important things that also has been mentioned here is the alignment with the existing policies. And uh, that's really important to integrate with the city plans and processes. Next slide, please, as I conclude. So uh, part of the work that we're doing at support <laughs> Part of the work that we're doing uh, at C40 at the moment is uh, is to help cities uh, 
to deliver two high impact policy implementation actions. So in Africa, for example, we, and in Nairobi specifically, uh, we are supporting the waste uh, organic separation and on-site treatment. So we are going to support the city uh, to sort of uh, start uh, separating the waste and, uh, and treating that uh, organic waste in those markets and uh, uh, sort of uh, scale up those actions so that they reduce the amount of uh, organic waste that goes to to the dam site, uh, but also there's a new there's a component of mainstreaming climate actions and making sure that these policies uh, are actually mainstreamed and actually integrated into the city uh, budgeting cycles, uh, annual development plans, and so on. In conclusion, I think one of the things that is missing is a is a link. How do we link uh, all these positive uh, uh, waste management efforts to to nutritional, positive nutritional outcomes. I think that's the missing link that we need to identify, especially when you're dealing with a population that is actually simply looking for food to eat, a population that more than 50% is food insecure. So how do you bring the nutritional narratives uh, to, the, to the table uh, in such a situation? Of course, we have a few, uh, uh, we have a few, initiatives, for example, the school feeding programs uh, that Cecilia mentioned, we have uh, city procurement powers that can use to procure uh, nutritious food. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, milk banks in, 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 in public hospitals to help uh, young babies and so on. But how do we then uh, link and tie those uh, together with uh, the benefits that we're getting from, uh, from, from uh, working on, on, on waste management issues? I think that's one of the, the, the challenges that I'll present to the presentation, to, to, to the panel today. Thank you very much for, 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 for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. And I would like to remind the, the speakers that there are also questions that are coming up in the Q&A module. So I would like to ask you to look at them and perhaps uh, answer in writing as time is running. But thank you so much, uh, indeed, Stephen, for presenting the, the case and the experience of, uh, of Nairobi, as well as the efforts that have been made, including in terms of the framework for Nairobi Food System Strategy. I very much like your, your, your slide on the, the five key things cities can do, uh, can do in terms of uh, building political will, technical support, and referring to evidence-based decision-making, as was already done by previous speakers. Uh, but also establish multi-stakeholder platforms and so on. I think this is uh, extremely good and, uh, and thank you for that presentation. Now, without further delay, I would like to move to the second part of this uh, session today and uh, give the floor to uh, Jessica Pera from uh, WHO, who will be facilitating, facilitating the, the discussion with our panelists, who will actually be reflecting on the case studies which we have been, uh, which we have just seen and uh, and see how we can draw some some lessons from that so jessica jessica you have about 15 minutes uh, for that so over to you thank you dominique and i'm happy to join you all here today as both a past local government employee delivering city health programs and current who consultant advocating for policy action to transform food systems for health as cecilia and abel have highlighted Urban settings are marked by a unique set of risk factors for malnutrition, including the wide inequalities in dietary intake between high and low income groups within the same city. Transforming local food systems to ensure that all citizens can access healthy, safe, affordable and desirable diets is essential to achieving the SDG2 target to end malnutrition in all its forms, as well as the interconnected targets for health, environment, sustainable consumption and sustainable cities. Around the world, there are so many examples of action, spearheaded by visionary local leaders who respond to the needs, wishes, and ideas of their population. Uh, from the innovative food waste projects, uh, urban agriculture and city zoning laws to support and protect healthy local businesses and produce markets, data revolutions to map the burden of malnutrition for targeted action, from Cape Town's tax on sugar sweetened beverages, Wagadogo's uh, healthy public procurement standards for city-owned institutions, Ottawa's almost 40-year ban on food marketing to children, and of course, all the inspiring case studies we've heard here today. To delve into these further, I would now like to turn to our panelists to share more on what they have learned from the dialogue series and today's case studies, and the key messages they hope others will take away to address nutrition in urban spaces 
as well, well as other issues of critical importance for achieving SDGs. First, I'd like to turn back to Cecilia. Uh, as coordinator of FAO's Urban Agenda, what are the key learnings here for how to deliver actions in the agenda? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I want uh, really to reflect and to connect uh, what has been presented to the, to the urban food agenda to the key learning. And I mean, I want to start, uh, first of all, thanking for the excellent presentation, which demonstrate uh, how the different typology of cities, we have big cities, Nairobi, then Pemba and, and Pune, are really active on the agenda and they are using different entry points. We are the market from Pemba, a city engagement campaign for Pune, reducing food waste as a mean for aligning efforts for, with climate and nutrition, uh, as Stephen was mentioning in the case of Nairobi. So what we can what we, we can learn is that all the entry points are important or are key uh, if uh, they are decided through a multi-stakeholder process. But what is fundamental and what is a still a challenge is the, the promotion of the system thinking, the integrated approach, and the connection that we can create between the different components of the food system and also between food system and other, and other systems. And I mean, I am familiar with the case of Nairobi. So there was a lot of work done at the local level, supported by FAO, supported by C40 for developing the food strategy. And there, was, there is a lot of work done for developing the climate action plan. So we need to connect the dot between the climate action plan and the food strategy. So we can use the planning, the tools that the municipality have, I mean, and the planning is one of the tools that the municipality can use to connect the food system with other agenda, nutrition and climate, uh, and to, con to have more impact, we need to, to, to work through a system thinking. So this is one key point, and which is related to my second one, which is the food governance. It's mentioned in all the cases, Pemba, Nairobi, Pune, they all mentioned about food governance. And that also FAO is putting in the urban food agenda, food governance mechanism at the centers. We support cities in established multi-stakeholder food governance mechanism. We promote meaningful and inclusive engagement of local authority from one side with the big political involvement, which is needed, and then multiple actors, no governmental organization, academic institution, all together to support the decision-making process in this agenda, the food agenda, which is still not considered particularly in intermediary and small cities in developing countries as an agenda that should be integrated into local policy and planning. Food is still an issue considered at national level in many cities. So we really need to, uh, to, to, to put together all the stakeholders and support the decision-making process for mainstreaming food system in local policy, planning and action. So the food governance is fundamental. And the other, the other element is this, 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 uh, this type of plan like the food strategy in Nairobi could help, could help in, in connecting the dot could help in, in integrating, in supporting the integrating approach and could be the instrument for this multi-stakeholder process uh, to be, uh, to, to align, uh, to, to connect the food strategy to national policy and to other plan, uh, to the other existing plan uh, at local and, 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 and the national level. The last point that I want to make is related to the importance of the city to city exchange. We heard from Pune the, the, this exchange with Birmingham and the FAO is working a lot on this exchange. I mean, we had in case of Nairobi, an exchange between Toronto and, and Nairobi on the food strategy. We worked on a food waste uh, exchange between Nairobi, Kigali and, and Milano. Uh, so, and we understood that we are increasingly understanding how, how much is important to, uh, uh, to sharing experience, to learn from each other, peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange is fundamental and it is requested from cities. So uh, again, food governance, planning, city-to-city uh, -city exchange, and also let me add the importance of connecting with the 
uh, with national government. Work across level of government is fundamental and is still missing in this agenda. I will stop here, thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. So a lot of key, key ingredients there for changing, transforming food systems, led by that systems thinking to connect the governments both internally within the city, then to the national level, and also fostering that city to city exchange there to learn from best practices, what's effective and what, what's not effective there. Now I'd like to move to Stratton Abungisha, the project manager for Site and Life's Nutrition in the City Ecosystems, which has the great acronym of NICE. Uh, Stratton, one, key, one of the key learnings coming out of this series is that formative research to understand basic systematic, systemic drivers of malnutrition is crucial. Can you share a bit more on this aspect in your current work as project manager for NICE? Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. With the next project, we have seen the role of the formative research to understand the drivers of, the, of malnutrition. Maybe a bit uh, on uh, the uh, next project, the nutrition city ecosystems called NICE is uh, landed with the um, uh, Swiss Agents for Development and Cooperation, SDC, Global Food Security Programs, and uh, it is implemented uh, by a Swiss consortium uh, comprising Swiss TPH, um, ETH Zurich, uh, Certain Life Foundation, and Syngenta Foundation uh, for um, Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture. And why? Because we adopted yeah, like uh, multiple intervention uh, from the food system governance support, strengthening the value chain and enhancing the demand for the nutritious food. With enhancing the uh, demand of nutritious uh, food, it's where right now um, the food, uh, the um, formative research comes in with the objective to understand the consumer insight. Because with the um, uh, food system, uh, city food system transformation, we want to understand the key uh, three main uh, food components, the food, the health, and the nutrition. So, and it's very important to understand the audience or city residents' perspective as far as food, health, and nutrition are concerned. And again, with the formative research, ladies, again, um, uh, it has helped to understand how um, cultural, social, and other factors influence uh, purchase, preparation, and consumption behavior. So we now spend with the formative research, spending uh, a time with um, with the uh, population. There is uh, just uh, um, an insight uh, to get how uh, the important decision on purchasing, preparation, and consumption just uh, is made, and how now the allocation, labor allocation. Sometimes uh, there are some surprises. Uh, you sometimes you think men, uh, women are more engaged, but when you spend them there just to find a, a, different, a, a different perspective. And again, with the formative research, uh, just, it was a, just a, an opportunity to understand what motivates the population, what are their aspirations, what their fears, and what their concerns are. With the uh, aspiration now, uh, uh, we have just a different perspective from young people, from just um, adolescent people, and also for, for parents. So we are now, uh, for example, for young, um, young people, just the big, uh, uh, having a special like, uh, uh, like um, food for enjoyment. Why now for mothers uh, and other parents will be just uh, looking for nutritious food because they, they care more about uh, the nutrition of household, um, uh, household um, population. And now, this deep insight for formative research help, uh, help us to understand how we regard the implementation of the nutrition intervention that led to changing behavior. And here now to recall uh, why now we conduct the, uh, the consumer research. It was just about to, fee, uh, to find relevant information that could, could allow us to develop a comprehensive marketing plan for nutri uh, nutritious food 
because uh, the overall goal of the project is just to increase the demand and access of the local uh, produced food. And we know that what, when it comes to nutrition, nutrition but lack of information on the how and consumer insights is the key, is the key part on, on this, which ultimately is where we achieve success. So with the formative research, we are sure that uh, we can just compile a kind of social marketing approach that could just uh, allow uh, people to change behavior towards adoption of nutritious food. Maybe I stop from here. Thank, Thank you, Jason. That's really good. And so, yeah, really helping that research drive the efforts and drive that consumer behavior change there um, in a well-informed way. Um, finally, I'd like to turn to Charlotte Fletcher, Global Program Director of Food Smart Cities with Rocolto. Charlotte, another key learning coming out of these dialogues is the need to enable cross systems working and particularly through strong coordination and capacity strengthening between different departments and sectors. The list here is too long. We've got food, public health, planning, em environment, employment uh, there. Can you tell us more about how the network on urban food governance for small and intermediary cities is working to catalyze collective action among food system actors? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. And thank you also for inviting Ricolto in this discussion. So uh, yes, since this year, we've started this collaboration with the uh, FAO uh, from the, the, the team uh, working on the urban food agenda to set up this network uh, of about 25 cities from Latin America, from Southeast Asia, from Africa, um, of small and intermediary cities, specifically, as you said, um, to, to discuss yeah how, how to go about these uh, food governance processes. So um, really what we're trying to do is is to, to, to build confidence you know, of, of, of uh, participants, uh, city representative mostly, but in some cases also allies that work with those cities and on the ground um, to get started with these processes. So it's really about uh, starting from the concrete experiences from these cities, um, very openly looking at what worked, what didn't, and, and trying to, to learn also from what has happened on the ground. Um, and also what we would like to do is, is to some extent to uh, uh, instill a sense of pride as well in, in the participants, because when you are sharing what you're doing externally, that also kind of reinforces what you are, de what you are doing. It also gives you often positive feedback. Um, and so um, in terms of capacity building, what we are planning to do um, together with uh, the team that Cecilia is leading is to um, bring all these lessons, all these insights into a publication that will uh, hopefully come out next year and will really be based on the experiences from the cities in the network, uh, really looking at um, yeah how to get started on um, yes uh, developing a multi-stakeholder platform in your city, how to get started with developing a local food policy or local food strategy, um, what you know would be uh, the right entry points to start working on on food budgeting, but food budgeting sorry or monitoring um, the impact of of these local food strategies. But also this, this issue of institutionalization that we, we saw in the, the presentation from, from Nairobi is very interesting. How to get these processes to continue in the long run when funding stops. So this is these are all these reflections that um, yeah, are coming out of this, this network of smaller intermediary cities, which obviously have different challenges than, than other um, metropolitan cities or, or bigger cities. Um, so maybe just to, to, to conclude, yeah, I think, I think we, we've seen it in the case of, of Pune and, and Birmingham, these, these exchanges are really critical uh, and, and, and they work even better when, when it's really based on evidence, on very concrete cases that have been documented with results uh, that can be shared. And, and that's what we are trying to do with the network. So maybe a final call to action. So if there's any interest from the participants who are working closely with the smaller intermediary cities, if, you, if you're interested in, in, in knowing more about the, the network, I'll post the link uh, in the chat and just uh, drop me an email. I'll put the put my email address there as well. So uh, thanks thanks again and um, yeah, uh, good luck with uh, the rest of the series. Thank you, Charlotte. And we look forward to that publication coming out. And of course, the link in the chat there to follow. So bringing it all together, um, it looks, you know, from all of our presenters today, it sounds like commitment, coordination, innovation, funding, systems thinking, building strong alliances, and sharing experiences uh, there, research to ensure evidence-based practice, and as well as passionate leaders who we've seen a lot of today. 
are the key ingredients to drive forward uh, nutritious urban food systems to really tackle malnutrition in all its forms. So thank you very much to all our panelists today and presenters also, and I'll hand back to you, Dominique. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you to the panelists and the presenters in bit, and thank you, Jessica, for being able to summarize so succinctly, but with all the keywords, uh, what came out of this very, very uh, interesting uh, conversation today. So thank you for that. Uh, and what we can see is that there is uh, clearly huge opportunities in cities and towns around the world to improve agri-food system for nutrition and beyond. And I hope that you have all been inspired by, uh, by the, the various examples which we have uh, presented uh, to you today. Uh, there is clearly, I would say, a lot of energy and commitment to making change. And, uh, and I'm delighted that, uh, that FAO uh, is working so actively uh, across the world with cities uh, to make that happen. Uh, we have indeed listened to, uh, to many contributions that have tied together uh, many threads of our discussion today and giving us a lot to think about. And uh, as for previous dialogues, we'll make sure and we'll have you, I hope, uh, Jessica, uh, at our next session to, to try to make a, a summary of the key points that have uh, emerged at today's conversation. Uh, because I think it's very important to capitalize and make sure that we have indeed a series, keeping in mind our goal to make sure that it informs policy making and there are, and there are indeed a, a lot of very, very good uh, recommendations that have emerged from today's uh, example. Again, I would like to, to thank our distinguished speakers uh, today uh, and, and discussions, uh, of course, to thank our Geneva partners, WHO, Gain, Sun, and to our colleagues in both the FAO uh, Food and Nutrition Division and the Brussels and Geneva uh, offices. And of course, last but not least, uh, big thank to, the, to all the participants. Uh, there were quite a number of questions that were asked in the Q&A module. They were all uh, responded to. Uh, but I think we want to, we are committed to, to keep the dialogue open, so please reach out uh, and we'll make sure that your comments are addressed to the, the right person. It will all, all our material and resources will also be uh, posted on the FAO Geneva uh, website so that you have all the information. Last but not least, I would like to inform you that our next uh, webinar uh, will take place in July on uh, the topic of food safety. So please stay tuned. There is a lot. Uh, we could, I'm sure, also discuss food safety and cities. I think all this is, uh, is interrelated, but uh, plenty of opportunities for, for learning, uh, for cross-learning, for exchanges uh, in the context of this series. Please use the opportunity and let's make sure it indeed feeds policy making. So with that, thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day and see you soon. Bye-bye.